Holy Spirit, you are just awesome. I mean, it's just so great to uh, be a part of what you're doing, trying to move to the rhythm of your grace instead of trying to manufacture something and then ask you to bless it. It's so great to watch you create, and we just get to be a part of it. So we just thank you for your word. And even as we study this tremendous portion out of the book of Romans, may you just move us from information to revelation today. Amen. 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 All right, I'd love you to, I love you anyway. This is unconditional love. But I would like it if you would open up your Bible to Romans chapter 8. There will be a day that we go through the entire book of Romans here as a Sunday series, but there's just been some stuff really kind of percolating in my heart lately, and I want to uh, unpack this for a few weeks in Romans chapter 8. But quite a few years ago, when I was in college, struggling with my own addiction, I remember one night I drove to this, this city park because I was so, so frustrated with choices that I kept making in my life. Now, you probably don't do this, but how many of you struggle with this kind of sin, repent, sin, repent, yeah. sin, repent cycle, right? Yeah. And I just found myself back in it again, and the, God, just the amount of condemnation and shame I was feeling, I just, I just remember it was probably one in the morning or something, and I drove to this park, and I just, you know, I, I didn't know what to do anymore. I just was going to give up, basically. Um, give up in faith, throw in the towel, quit trying to be something I wasn't. And, and I just knew how angry God must have been at me because of all the promises I kept making. Any of you ever make a promise to God and break it? Five of you? Jeez, you're in the wrong. <laughs> Look, I'm just going to be honest. You're in the wrong church. <laughs> Has anybody here ever made a promise to God and broke it? Yeah, okay, right? Just like, just that sense. Like, God, I'm such a disappointment to you. And so I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm just not sure what to do, but the heaviness of it was kind of getting overwhelming. And, and I, you know, you can, you don't have to believe me. Um, you weren't in my car, but I was. In the midst of all that, all of a sudden, my radio turned on. I mean, like, engine was off. I was just sitting there in the dark and weeping. And, and all of a sudden, like, my radio, nothing else turned on. My radio just turned on. And this song started playing that um, it's a song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean a number of years ago redid it. I think it was Benny Hester way back then. That'll age me a bit. But the song was called When God Ran. And it's a story basically of the prodigal son, of when his heart had turned, and then God ran back to his son. And that song just popped on my radio. It was the weirdest thing. And I knew at that moment that the war was over. Amen. The war in my soul of whether or not God would accept me or love me, or receive me, it was over. Now, there were still some battles to be won, but the war was over. And, I, and this, I hope by the time some of you leave today, this message rings clear and true to you as well, that the war can be over. Now, your, yours and my relationship with God is a journey, it's a process, He's constantly working things out of us and through us and, and stuff like that. But the actual war of whether or not we are loved, forgiven, and accepted, that one's already been won. Amen. And so, you know, last, last week, uh, some of you know, I, I write a contribution in the Car Springs Independent. That's the dark side of newspapers in our city. Um, it's called In Good Faith, and it's just... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of a panel of different religious people that write and try to answer questions. Last, last week's question was really, it said, uh, if there's one God, why are there thousands, literally, of religions out there? And, and so there, you don't have to read the response up there. But, the, but the, the main thing was, well, it's because there's a thousand opinions out there. 
you know, and God created us in his image and we return to favor basically, right? And so, but in thinking about that, I got to thinking, so how do you really know, like in this faith with Christ and, and being a Christian, how do you know you got the right one, right? How do you know, like, did I just inherit this or is this like the real deal? And, and sometimes that's part of our struggle is how do you know in your knower that you have authentic faith and you're not just playing a game? You're not just showing up on church pretending to be something that you're really in your core not. And then if you're like things that I've experienced, then sometimes your, your behavior starts to betray you. And you think, well, I can't be a Christian because look what I'm doing. I can't be a Christian because look how I treated, you know, my husband or my wife. Or I can't be a Christian because, oh, my gosh, look at the word that just came out of my mouth, you know. I said phooey. Anyway, so we have these, you know, so how do you know if you have found real faith? I mean, good faith, healthy faith, not religious faith, the kind of faith that you can, you can hold on to when your life has fallen apart and know it's, it's substantial the kind of faith that can bear the weight of your, of your life. The, the kind of faith that in, you know, ensures your eternal destiny, but also fulfills a promise that you can live life and live life abundantly. You can have wholeness and peace in, in your life. How do, you, how do you live that kind of faith? And so Romans is a great book that kind of does that. So just for a moment here, let me give you some context of Romans in case you haven't read it. Um, it was written to the... Roman side. This church is so astute, right? It was written to the Christians in Rome. Now, when this was written to them, they were being eaten by lions. So it wasn't a great season of life to be a Christian, okay? They're being sold into slavery and a lot of oppression and, and things like that. And, and so, you know, let's start off with, a, you know, looking at Romans just basically kind of talks about where we start in life and, and in terms of relationship with God and, and then how we struggle and then how we find our destination. And so it really begins with what I like to call 223s. Uh, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, basically in the beginning of the book. And I'm going to read most of what I do out of this series out of the New Living Translation. But uh, I think we use NIV here and whatever you open your Bible app to. Because Romans 3.23 says this, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. It's kind of human nature. We're all jacked up somewhere, right? Any surprises there? So Romans 6.23 kind of continues that idea and, and says, For the wages of the payment that you and I make with the sin in our life is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So at some point we come to this, this choice, like we can continue to owe the brokenness and the sin in our lives, and it ultimately it yields death in our lives. Now, that can be eternal death, but how many of you know a lot of us are dying just with choices we make anyway, right? I mean, what is sickness? Sickness is just death slowed down. What is addiction? Addictness, addiction is a disease that leads to death. What is toxic relationships? It steals the life out of everything. Right? I'm not saying anything most of us don't know. It's pretty obvious. And I think sometimes we've been beat up with these verses, but if we just took an honest look at our lives, a lot of us would go, yeah, I get it. The payment of sin and brokenness in my life has always yielded death at some point. Right? Sin will always take you further than you want to go, make you stay longer than you wanted to stay, and then ask you to pay a price you cannot possibly pay. And so as Paul lays this out in Romans, we begin to see this. But he says, but there is a free gift of God. There is eternal life that you and I can experience. We don't have to live under the tyranny of religion or my addictions or myself any longer. There is a way out of this thing. And that's what he begins to point us towards in Romans 7. He, he begins to talk about this struggle that we deal with in our lives. As we begin to get our lives right with God, there's this verse that just kind of pops out of Romans 7. I call it the doo-doo verse, but it's in Romans 7, 15. It says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Anybody relate to that one? 
right? And that's the battle we find ourselves in and the struggle so much in life. And, and so in Romans 7, 14 through 25, Paul is just kind of unloading this thing about the struggle that you and I have trying to live up to a standard but being broken in of our flesh and, and the condemnation that comes in and the guilt that comes in. And finally, he's like, I don't know what to do with myself. And he moves us straight in to Romans 8 with the opening line, which is this, there is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is where it starts. Amen. This is where this life begins. And so in Romans 8, as we begin to look at this, so there's now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So how do you know? How do you know if you found this kind of faith? How do you know that you are walking and no condemnation, not just kind of professing it, but believing it in your believer. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you know that this kind of power is active in your life? Well, in the midst of this incredible theological treaty that, that Paul is painting in the book of Romans, the incredible statements he's making about living under the law and under freedom and all this, this, this verse 814 just kind of pops out, and, and sometimes we miss it because of the, the gems on both sides of it that are so profound, but in, in 8.14, he just says this simple statement, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now, I want you to read that with me. What does 8.14 say? So this verse seems to make it clear that one of the foremost issues you and I have got to work out in our lives or are you or are you not being led by the Spirit? Because those who are are children of God and those who are not are not. Wow. Right? <laughs> So this is kind of what, what begins to happen. This appears to make a hands-down case for you and I regarding whether or not we can consider ourselves children of God. Now, God loves all, all his creation, all his kids, but there's this point of, are you or are you not saved? Are, you know, you can use whatever term you want. I oftentimes talk about learning to be an apprentice of Christ, right? You might, you've grown up in the world, are you saved or are you sanctified? You know, are you, are you a, a Christian? Are, did you get Jesus? You know, um, are, are you washed in the blood, brother, sister? You know, what, you know, there's all kinds of words out there, but ultimately it comes back to this point. Has there been a fundamental shift in who's on the throne of your life? If you are adopted into the family of God, those who are sons of God find themselves, or daughters of God, find themselves led by the Spirit of God. Amen. So that's great except that I really think I am, and then I do stupid things. So does that mean I'm not? Like, you can drive yourself crazy with some of this sometimes, right? Looking at your behaviors and trying to decide if, if, if that means I'm saved or not, and there's a lot of holiness people and religious people out there that if you break rules, then suddenly you're out and, and other people are in, and, you know, and if you sing the right songs or do the right things and stuff like that. And so... But it's really important that we begin to get this. I mean, this, this thing, are you, are you not led by the Spirit of God, becomes so important to people that some people fake it. Some people pretend like they're children of God when they're really not. I mean, you, you just, you, but you get that. Like, you can't live like the devil all week long and then come in and pretend like, because you sang a few songs, everything's right. Right? Now, you walk in there, I don't care how you walk in there, what kind of garbage or crap or choices you've made, you're still loved. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking, are you or are you not a child of God? Because something fundamentally changes inside of us when we get it right. And so how do you really know? Well, Paul gives a number of uh, mile markers along the way to help us understand that. Uh, let me read this. I love this little section out of uh, Ragamuffin Gospel with Brendan Manning. 
about this tension we live in. He says, when I get honest, I admit I am a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good, and I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I am trusting and suspicious. I am honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I am a rational animal. I say I'm an, an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. <laughs> to live by grace means to acknowledge my whole life story, the light side and the dark. In admitting my shadow side, I learn who I am and what God's grace means. As Thomas Merton put it, a saint is not someone who is good, but who experiences the goodness of God. So Paul, in the middle of Romans 8, really kind of lays out for us what I like to say are just eight road signs along the way. If you are a person who's in process, in your growth, in your relationship as a child of God, you are going to pass through, pass by these markers at some point in your life. And so my encouragement for us over the next couple of weeks is don't get hung up on any one, right? But look at your life as a, as a process, as a cycle, as a journey that God's moving you through some things. And it really, now, you know, so there's these signs that we see. Now, some signs, honestly, aren't great. Like, I, I, if you're in missions, you know this, but I, I was in India a few years ago, and, and we went to this restaurant because there's a lot of unclean water around India and stuff like that. And there's a sign at this restaurant that said, um, um, to our patrons, um, please be assured the manager has personally passed all the water used in this establishment. <laughs> I did not order a glass of water after that point, right? I mean, there's some signs that you just have to be careful of, um, like this one, <laughs> to not take things too literally. Or this one here. Um, may or may not be true. That's up to you. Um, I love this one. It says, uh, texting while driving kills. And then just underneath, for more driving tips, text safety to 79191. Well, that's a great sign to have on a highway, isn't it? And then you can determine what's going on there. Spacing in letters becomes very important. All right. Here... Over the next couple weeks are eight trustworthy signs you can take to the bank. Eight things that you can hold on to in your journey as an authentic follower of Christ's. And it began with verse 1. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The first sign that you pass when it comes to becoming a child of God is peace. You make peace with God. This is the first issue you and I have got to settle with God. You know you're a child of God when you have been led to the cross, when you have taken a look at your life and realized it's better if somebody else is on the throne of your life than yourself. If you realize that all the garbage and all the mistakes and all the things you have done in the past, all the ways that you have been at war with your creator has been settled at the cross of Christ, you can make peace. The battle is over. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was finished. That is the reality. The devil wants you and I to continue to battle, to be at war with God, to wonder things about if you're in or out or whatever. It was done at the cross. There's no more debating in your life at some point. There's no more debating in your life who gets to be in charge. You have decided that, that Christ himself is the master of life and he can be the master of yours. You have made that decision. That means that every curse that has been spoken over your life has now been paid for. It has been bought. Every mistake that you made that made you feel unworthy or unlovable or unpurposeful has been paid for. Your slate has been wiped clean. The war is over. 
Even the devil knows this. Now, there's still battles to be won. We still get to wrestle through this because the, the enemy doesn't give up turf very easily. But the reality is the war is over. And when we can start to walk from that place, that's why in Romans 8, 1 through uh, 6, Paul really begins to lay this out. Notice in verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So part of what it is is stop trying so hard. Let your mind focus on that, on what Christ has done for you, on the love that he has for you. If you can establish peace, it's the first mile marker on your journey towards becoming everything God has created you to be. I mean, it kind of makes sense in John 20, you know, after the resurrection and uh, Jesus had been crucified and resurrected and the, everybody's kind of hanging out in fear in a room, wondering what's going to happen next. They've lost their rabbi. You know, the Romans are on a tirade. And, and Jesus, he just appears in the, the, it didn't even say he knocked on the door or anything. Like he just appeared in the room. You can do that when you're God. It'd be really fun. But anyway. <laughs> and what's the first thing he says to all his freaked out followers? Peace to you. And then it says he showed them his hands and his side. So Jesus appears, everybody's afraid, and the first thing he says is peace to you, and then he shows them his hands and his side. It's like Jesus is trying to say, what I just said to you is directly connected to what I just did for you. You have the opportunity to make peace with God because of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. I don't know how hard I can push this today for you and I. The cross was not just a statement of your sin or my sin or our brokenness. Even more profoundly, it was a statement of your value. Amen. The battle is over. You are worthy. Amen. The battle is over. You are lovable. The battle is over. You can be a child. There are no more orphans. This is what God is trying to communicate. Jesus, when he showed up, said, peace to you. And then, it's interesting, right after that, he says it again. He says, peace to you. As a matter of fact, he said it this way. As the Father has sent me, now I send you peace. So what happens in that situation is peace isn't only making peace with God, but we also have the opportunity to receive the peace of God. In any circumstance you and I walk into, we have the peace of God. He said, as the Father sent me, now I'm going to send you. You like the way I did it? Just walk in the same acceptance and love and worth that I had from my Father and you'll experience the same peace in any circumstance you get sent into. That is why the first road sign on you and I being led by the Spirit of God is we begin to experience the peace of God. Go like this if you're with me. Right. So, so many things begin to happen. Now listen, I cannot be at peace with God and at war with you. That doesn't work very well, does it? Right? Because the peace of God isn't something I just have peace with God. I also walk with the peace of God. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Like if you want to walk in a blessed life, let the peace, the shalom that God has worked in you, work through you towards others. It means if you have been forgiven of much, learn to forgive much. It's amazing how that begins to walk out in our lives, in our relationships. How many of you found it easier, once you experienced the forgiveness of God, to actually release some other people from debts they owed you? Right? Like it's, you don't have to manufacture it as much. It just becomes a natural part of who you are. And so, do you get it? What's the first road sign? Peace. peace. And peace leads us to the second thing, and it starts in verse 11, <coughs> when it says this. 
The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Okay, so there's something at work, right? The same Spirit that raised Christ is now at work in you. And if, if God's Spirit is at work in you, do you think something's going to happen? So he says this, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. The second thing that begins to happen when you make peace with God is you begin to move into purity in your life. Something begins to change inside of you and your life comes into alignment with the way God wants you to live, right? Now, now hang with me here, especially you guys have been raised in church, okay? Don't tune me out. Because most of us in church were taught it this way. You better get your life pure. You better stop smoking. You better stop carousing. You better stop listening to rock and roll and playing Xbox because you're not going to be loved. You can't go into God's holy, holy house looking like that, sister, because you're going to cause me to lust. You know? you know what I'm saying? It's like this whole thing. So we get this idea that I got to get all pure and cleaned up if I'm going to get my life right with God. And the reality is the other way. Just make peace with God and you'll begin to find things in your life begin to change. They begin to line up. I mean, again, how many of you experienced this? Like, when, when you actually got your life right with God, made peace with God, how many some things just started to drop off your life that used to really be challenges for you, right? I mean, I meet people all the time around here every week that, that struggle with whether it's sexuality or chemicals or all kinds of stuff, and they're like, man, I, I just have never been this way, but I really feel like I want to stop whatever. And it's not because they have to so they can be liked around here or, or something. It's just like something in them's changing. Other times I meet people like, you know, they've been going through cyclical sexual relationships. And then God meets them and forgives them. And, and all of a sudden they're like, I, I just don't need another human being that way like I used to. I don't know what's changed inside of me. What's changed inside of you is the spirit of God lives inside of you now. And he doesn't need that right? He gives wholeness. He didn't steal life from people. He gives it. And so this is kind of what's beginning to happen here. When the Spirit of God raised Christ from the dead, he began to show us that the dead things inside of us can be raised again. That's what purity is about. It's about your life coming back into its created intention, right? So I don't want to point out any one kind of purity um, because that's not fair, right? We're all dirty somewhere, right? We're all broken somewhere. We're all kind of make poor choices somewhere. But this is what it is. If the Spirit is alive in you, you are going to change. It is a natural part of the process. It is like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that when it starts to take root, it just grows. And it almost becomes unstoppable. Anybody here ever live in the South? You know what kudzu is? Right, kudzu is this insane vine that grow, and it was—it's not native to the South, but you can't hardly go anywhere around. I know Louisiana and stuff without just seeing things taken over by this vine, right? And it's—it's it's just so hard to stop it. That's kind of what happens when you say, "God, here I am. Um, if you'll take me, I'm yours." And then you make this really stupid statement: "Do with me whatever you like," <laughs> right? Or maybe you say something like, God, just cleanse me, right? Make me pure. Like, you know he's listening, don't you? Okay? And the kingdom of God gets birthed inside of you, and you don't even know what's happening. Now, here's the deal. You can fertilize it. You can get into the word. You can, you know, be worshiping. You can, you can be praying, and it's like adding fertilizer to this kingdom thing that's just starting to grow inside of you. And as it grows inside of you, things change outside of you. That is why the first road sign you pass in the kingdom is what? Peace. Peace. And then the second one? 
is purity, this drive towards being what God wants you to be. John chapter 2 it quotes it this way. They're watching Jesus in the temple, and, and Jesus was so frustrated because so many things were interfering with people's ability to just connect with the forgiveness of his Father. So he's overturning the tables. He's overturning all the things that are standing in the way of people just experiencing Abba's love. And one of his disciples remembered this verse in the Old Testament and said, whoa, zeal for his father's house will consume him. Do you know that Jesus is consumed with you? He's consumed with your house. He desires so much for you and I to become everything we've been created to be. He is not just wanting to purge junk out of your life. He's not like some sadistic God that just, I just want to punish them to make them like little robots. No, he just sees the, yours and my created potential and he wants to call that out. And he's not going to stop because you gave him permission to come in at one point. And he is consumed with love for you and I. He is consumed with seeing the very best in your life and mine come out. And so you'll know you're being led by the Spirit of God. As you make peace with God, as you begin to experience the desire for purity of God, and out in the distance, you're going to see roadside number three, which we're going to deal with next week. So let's stand. Amen. Man, it's like watching The Bachelor, and it just ends. Who got the rose? No, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> May you, my friends, walk out of here with confidence knowing the war is over. May you walk not under a cloud of condemnation or fear of your God, but may you walk with the knowledge that you are loved unconditionally, that the peace of God can flow out of your life because you can make peace with God in your life. I bless each of you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. 